Thanks, Brayden. Sure. Uh, let's see. Okay, we're recording now. Um, okay. Welcome everybody to the to the last of these tangents faculty talks. Um, there you go. Are you sharing your screen now, Kim? Correct. Yep, that's great. Thank you. I just want to I just want to say a couple words here first, Ian, before you begin. Yep. Um, welcome again, everybody. And uh, this is the last, this is the fifth and final of these tangents talks happening this uh, strange spring. Um, and I think it's been really fun. I think it's been really successful. I think the students have really enjoyed it as well. And already after the first one that we had, we anticipated wanting to continue this in the fall, which I'm sure we'll do. But now I'm thinking there's no reason why we wouldn't be able to continue it even in the summer. So. Let's, uh, let's see, you'll obviously find out about that as we try to figure it out as well. Uh, just as a bit of review, these Tangents talks try to uh, utilize our faculty's diverse interests and passions uh, as they present themes and content to us that doesn't specifically belong within the architecture curriculum. So these talks are about things that we all want you students to know even if uh, we don't actually include in every course or in courses that you take in the School of Architecture. Uh, so I think they've been pretty fun. Uh, we had Ethan Wood at the beginning with San Francisco Modernism. Uh, we had Zachary Mead after that, Lessons from a Sole Proprietorship. We had uh, David Gill uh, in the middle there about materiality, making, and meaning. And last week, Philip Raw and Sensing the Site, and today, uh, Yim Zhu will talk about China's dialogic with contemporary architecture. Okay, so we've now got a good about 45 people here. Um, Yim, why don't you go ahead and take it away and I'll continue to let people in. Okay, great. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope that um, everyone's also being productive in this sequestered environment that we're in. Um, what I wanted to share with all of you is a particular lens um, that I look through in architecture. Um, the topic today is, um, my particular topic is China's dialogic with contemporary architecture. Uh, but I wanted to share with everyone that in my practice of architecture, um, I've actually worked in the Middle East and also I've worked in projects in, in Southern China in Guangzhou where my family came from. So there's a particular interest, especially right now, uh, because through the contacts of one of our students whose thesis project I'll share with you, um, there's a contact for me to have an opportunity to create senior housing for a Chinese developer in New York City. Um, so there's the connection. Um, what I wanted to begin with is um, these, this image right here is actually the beginning of a thesis project uh, by Jinming Tina Chen. Her thesis project especially, is, it, it is called Going Beyond, but it really touches on an essential interest that I find a lot of students from China come to the States and not only to California, but East Coast and even um, the Midwest, like Kansas State and Chicago. And I've met students from China that were particularly particularly here, interested in the education um, in the Western framework um, because the dialogue of architecture in China is changing in a very uh, quick course, especially within the last five to six years. So Tina's thesis essentially is um, around uh, um, uh, a museum project where the display of artifacts and architectural construction was the heart of the project. So I won't go through every single uh, slide, but I just want to mention that it is cited um, in uh, Tianjin, which is where she's working. Uh, the museum site is right here. Uh, and it's also next to Lang Shuning, which, uh, and Liu Shichen, which are the two originators of uh, the understanding of craft and architecture in Chinese architecture. And I uh, just wanted to share some of the drawings in which she created the different, uh, a language by studying essentially the dugong. Um, that, that is essentially the heart of her scheme. 
um, but by analyzing and creating uh, a system both for the vertical structure, for its bracket system itself, and the roof system uh, is what then gave her the opportunity and the thoughtfulness to create this museum piece um, for her thesis. I wanted to also share, uh, there is, um, she is now working in the Tianjin University um, Research Institute of Architectural Design and Urban Planning. She essentially is now a licensed architect, having graduated um, three years ago, um, has her own projects, and this is a kindergarten where she is utilizing a set of screens. Um, it'll be all hand-built uh, for this kindergarten school. And also she cited uh, Kengo Kuma's uh, bamboo house built in China as well along the Great Wall. I'm um, so. oh, using utilizing wood flame construction, and it becomes a plug-in um, for vacant lots uh, air rights above buildings because of the density. Um, well, it wants to be densified for the housing issues that are happening right now in Tianjin. There is a. Another thesis project, um, Victor uh, Chang Se Song, uh, who I was fortunate to um, be an outside um, thesis advisor. Um, and this is in Suzhou, uh, a place that's like the Venice water canals. And his analogy um, for intensifying Suzhou and building within it uh, without building the towers that Suzhou would like to build is a typology analysis of what is there. Uh, and then by understanding what the typology is, he reformulated the, the typologies. So here's a diagram really of a process that he's implementing, which means that uh, Suzhou was interested in these tall towers. He's challenging that within the waterways, um, reassembling its architectural architectural dynamic pieces in the city and in the reassemblage creates a different kind of city. So I just want to show you a process where he dissected 380 elements, identified each one, created a vertical dialogue of their idea of assembly, which um, may seem chaotic, but it's also along the lines of thinking that uh, Farshid Musavi has been uh, writing about in elements um, of style. Uh, just to give you an idea of how he reconfigured these um, elements to recreate a set of typologies within the city, um, here's an, an ensemble of a set of pieces, a hypothetical ensemble, and then what he envisions to be in the city of Suzhou of varying heights and, and texture. Um, I begin by saying um, that one of my favorite critics that I have translated and read about is Li Shangning. He's the deputy dean at Tongji University, and some of you that are quite fluent in Chinese, and your Chinese will be better than mine, um, he writes uh, quite well. He's one of the few architectural critics looking at uh, with a critical eye about the work in China. And his lens is understanding that, yes, China has been a cultural sponge. And so I'm showing an image of um, Shanghai looking towards uh, Pudong uh, in 1987, and then Shanghai looking at Pudong. Uh, this was in 2013. Uh, so the idea of this cultural sponge has been on the minds of a lot of uh, designers, uh, architects, designers in China, um, including, including um, international folks working in China. And so you see the dilemma of the pastiche of rooftops, uh, even of the pattern of the exterior or the influences of um, the international style or influences uh, from um, American and 
uh, European cities. And I just want to share with you an image of uh, what, what the context of some of the streets in China, what some of the neighborhoods are like uh, as well. And counter to that discussion, um, be, because the rise of uh, the economic um, opportunities in China uh, causes a lot of thought about what is being built. And so you have individuals uh, such as Wang Xu. Uh, there's a larger dialogue uh, with um, Ma Yang Song, Zhu Kei, um, a lot of uh, architects in this whole genre who, and who have created um, work and are being critical about the dialogue happening in China. Um, here's a painting that um, it's by Yang Yonglang. Uh, this is a collage of the modern city um, in the style of what would have been what we understand to be a Chinese painting, but a critique of what is happening to the sort of the cultural reading or the what is the cultural resistant resiliency of China at this point. Um, I'm sharing these images of um, the excavations of cities for these new construction, uh, abandoned towns as they overgrow. It's actually quite beautiful, um, yet they're being abandoned because um, village folks are moving to the city, um, leaving the elders and um, other families behind. And then this sort of pastiche of the, uh, of, um, of a, of the Eiffel Tower um, in, in you know, a context of a manufacturing a plant, it's in a park. Um, not necessarily a criticism, but it's all suburb, although now I understand that it's not vacant anymore uh, because there's such a housing shortage that uh, everyone has bought up a lot of the properties. And then these kind of islands, artificial islands that are being built and even housing that is in the image of the three deities, right? Um, so you have this kind of pastiche happening as well. Um, so to just move forward, I wanna share um, some thoughts about um, the work of Zhu Pei. I think a lot of you may know about um, Zhu Pei Studio. Uh, this, this is the imperial, uh, this is the museum of the imperial kiln. And what is very evident in a lot of current work, um, so Zhu Pei's, um, this museum is located in, the, in the, what is called the capital of, the, of uh, porcelain in uh, the northeast part, uh, northeast part of China. Uh, and it hovers around the, the uh, Chang River. Uh, what is quite beautiful, though, is that the uh, the making of tile of pottery from this kiln has allowed for, uh, and then these arches that you see at the lower right side, which is also which which houses the kilns themselves, becomes a language that's important for this um, museum. Um, and so I just have some images of um, the interior space of the kiln. And juxtaposed on the lower middle is the test, um, the test and the beginning of the construction of the museum itself. Uh, and just for our students, um, there's a 3D printed model. Uh, it was done at the end though, not, not um, it is part of the process. So let me just show you some process um, images such as this. These were some of the, um, pieces uh, that were built. Uh, I actually did see a wood model at one time and I tried to get a hold of that image, but it, I couldn't get it from their office. Um, and just to show you the section, um, it, it faces the Lilong um, temple building, uh, but it's not on axes uh, to it. And you enter uh, into the museum through a series of portals uh, so the entries on the right side, you would descend downward. Uh, these, are, these are actually the renders that were created. And I'll show you the actual, here's the photograph of how you enter. So the Lilong Museum, uh, the Lilong Pavilion is to our left and you would enter um, um, 
as a cross cut into the museum. So you would go either left or right. And it is an active museum. And so very much in the light of some of the cultural anthropologists who who prefer our thinking to be more that the museum is curating the current and thoughtful works. Uh, this museum also, uh, let's see, what I remember is it, um, it restores and captures some of the lost um, uh, pottery pieces that you find in the area. So it's actually brought back to the museum and, and worked on um, actively. Here's an interior space through the entry, and we would move through the museum uh, as we move towards the view looking at the housing across the street. Okay, you also descend down into the museum. Uh, so from the street side, you see the water and you can also, because the water's not so deep, you can also walk, well, you're not encouraged to walk into the water, but it, it is a pond. Um, but there's an understanding that in that cut of the water, there's also the cut to a lower level, which as you descend downward, uh, come upon this space, um, which is a, a refuge. Uh, so the sound of water is prevalent. Uh, and Zhu Pei's quote is that the Chinese culture is deeply rooted in nature and how we use it is to discover um, this principle of modern architecture or the contemporary architecture of China right now. Uh, I'm moving forward to um, Amateur Architecture Studio. Most of you know, um, this is the work uh, of Wang Chu and Lu Wenyu, who is um, his partner and his wife. And, it actually should be equally shared, but since Wang Shu won the Pritzker Prize, he, shared, he um, probably gets the thunder. But she herself is also a noted educator um, at the Chinese Academy of Art. Um, a Chinese Academy, yes, Chinese Academy of Art. And in her teachings, um, there's a, um, she always shares this image of this bracket system or the donggu and um, one of my students actually told me that, boy, it's pretty complicated because it talks about not only the distances of the modules of how they intersect, but that there's many types of donggu as well. So in this aspect of joinery, the first semester, all the students um, um, make these chairs. And so you, you're actually seeing uh, Lu and Yu uh, in the midst of an exhibit of the chairs. Um, then I just want to share an image, um, Wang Shu, and then here's the Ningbo uh, Museum, the historical museum. And just a reminder, because I know all of you are very familiar with this building, um, it's almost as if when you read the use of materials, and these are all local materials fabricated uh, by local artisans, um, that you almost read the section of the building because as you descend up and down in the building, um, you also read this textual character of the stone. Very much like um, the, uh, let's see, let me just show this one. This is um, the China Academy of Art, which is also done by amateur architecture as well. Um, what I wanted to say is that similar in the use of craft of material, um, Chu Pei, uh, the first project that I showed earlier um, of the Kiln Museum is also made by local craftspeople, all taken from the earth and uh, made in the kilns there. So in a very similar way, the stone uh, from the China Academy, uh, China Art Academy in Shangshan, Shang I'm speaking Cantonese, you guys, in case those of you that speak Mandarin <laughs> saw our accents are slightly different. Um, these are made, uh, these, the stonework is cut locally as well as the screens are crafted by local artisans. And then some of the concrete screens are poured uh, in place for structure as well. Um, just the kind of memory about how amateur architects capture light. This is very consistent in their work. 
Um, the third person I wanted to share, which a lot of you have used as part of your analysis project, um, is a Taiye Day House, Liu Yichun. Uh, this pro their practice is in Shanghai, and the Long Museum is also in Shanghai. Um, you might have learned from the, uh, the diagram of this is a series of bars, but he was uh, the bars very much like the bars of the Kimball um, Art Museum. He was truly inspired by Louis Kahn and understood that the quality, quality of light is the most powerful in a museum space and that the, it is the work that you are showing and the light quality. Uh, I love this diagram on the left because that is the essence of the idea of the project, which is it the structure, the structure of its concrete uh, and then of the roof and that the second level also is part of that structure as well. And then just to share with you some interior spaces. Um, the exterior is actually a screen. Um, uh, it's a fritted screen with a uh, glass. And then another view of the interior space, which is reflective of that diagram that I just shared with everyone. Um, so what I want to say is that this dialogue um, reflects a, a, a set of prolific work that I see our students, um, they are now having these opportunities in their workplace, whether you are working here uh, and you have the opportunity to do work um, in China or you have a client that is sensitive to this or you are in China and you are going back um, to share your education and thoughts, uh, but that this kind of prolificness is part of what I would call um, a didactic um, and dialogic and dynamic dialogue that I hope would um, keep continuing. Okay, thank you for um, sharing this with me. And I'm happy to um, take any questions if anyone has. Um, I probably moved through this a little too quick because I was just making sure that I didn't exceed the time that <laughs> Fred and I were discussing. You have, uh, they have a lot of um, factories that stored around the architectural um, sites in uh, China. Uh, I'm sorry, repeat that again. Hold on a second. Is there a lot of um, factories that's located near the sites around China? Yeah, so maybe I didn't make it too clear, Lamar. The, a lot of the work, including the, ha uh, including the Kill Museum, yeah. are actually crafted. So the, the idea of, um, so you know how we're used to factories making brick and concrete and it's, and it's a whole systematized. Um, what's unique about the work that I'm sharing with everyone is that it, they're actually local artisans. Um, so in fact, I'm gonna go back to like the, um, the Imperial Muse Kiln Museum. These are made, these are all crafted by the local people in in this city, okay. and then assembled. So I show I was showing a picture of the of the structure of the construction. Um, so all the local craftspeople are involved. You're hired to do this. Um. You're hired to make the brick, um, the sizes vary or in the Ningbao Museum, it actually has to do with the size of the stone that's local. Um, so it's a good question. It's very different than what we're used to here. And in a way, I really envy this kind of opportunity. 
And there's nothing to say that, like what Tina told me is that, well, there's also curtain wall systems uh, that we're beginning to buy, like your sweets catalog. Um, so I think that some of that is also filtered um, in, into China, like the systems technology. Um, but at least the pieces I was biasing this presentation is all about the craft and from the craft you have the ability to have this dialogue of what China's architecture is, what's happening right now. Okay. Nice, I'm glad I do that though. Yeah, good question. It gives the people the opportunity to, uh, to commit into the uh, community itself. Exactly, yep. In fact, Lou, when you had mentioned that when she was working on the Ningbao Museum, um, she was feeling that it wasn't as perfect as it can be because they, they allowed the craftspeople to assemble the stonework um, the way that they thought it should be. And then later she and Wang Shu realized, oh no, let's, let's create some order with the stone. So I think they don't show us the, they only show us the good photos. Um, huh. Yeah. Ian, there's a series of uh, questions that are um, oh, okay. ending down the, uh, the group chat here. We've got several questions for you. Um, one is about education. There's a question about education of young, young architects in China as compared with those of students here. Are there some differences or similarities? Um, so what's happening right now, uh, be, because, um, so let me share something else I didn't, um, so Tina, is also teaching uh, as a studio professor, uh, not a professor because she's still too young. But um, so what's happening is students that are educated abroad come back and they affect the teaching. Plus you have people like Li Yang, Li, Li Shanning, who writes a lot and the critique of his work, of the theory. So he actually um, uh, went to school with Michael Hayes um, at MIT. And so they studied on the people like Frampton and all that. And so there were certain readings that Li Shanning brought back. So apparently a lot of that um, that's being written and critiqued and theorized is pervasive now in a lot of the architecture schools, which is why this dialogue is very critical now in the next few years. We're probably going to see a whole different genre of teaching and of students coming out and of influencing this current context that's been happening with work like this, like the past 10 years of work. Um, it may not be different than so what Tina said is, um, you know, how do you teach a design studio? And it's very much in a way like uh, when I showed um, Lu Wen Yu's first studio, which has to do with making a chair and understanding how structure works, um, but also with an aesthetic agenda. Um, so it's all in her lens at the China Art Academy, it's through craft and construction. Uh, it would be good to see what it's like in other schools. I, I looked at um, uh, Tianjin and Tsinghua University. Uh, the work is constantly changing now and I'm pretty sure that it's changing uh, because if you look at the presentations and the result of student works, you can tell that there are influences that are much more current, much more about a discussion. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I think so. I think it speaks to what you're calling the dialogue or the dialogic. Right. Which is to say, you know, which is different than a monologue, obviously, in that Correct. The, the contemporary architecture that you're referencing is one thing, and then there's contemporary architecture in China. We have two things that are separate but related and participatory entities. 
relaying things off of each other. Um, and, and things bounce from one side to another and you can kind of see that historically almost in the work. Um, there's, a, there's another question regarding whether projects still need to run through design institutes and if so or not, how are local artisans brought into the construction project practice? Right, so that's a good question. Um, you know, in a way, I, I also can say that Tina works for a design institute. Um, and there's a delicate balance. Uh, there's the, you know, when I, when I thought about this project, there are all these other larger firms in China that, that are reviewed by, um, well, they're just, they're, they're approved, right? They, they're through the lens that that's not about a critical eye. It's, it's about, oh, we have this need, let's get this built, we have this money, let's, the dialogue or the thought of what, we're what, what is being built there is not, um, is not an even exchange. And so this, these are, the ones that I show today are actually practices that have, that have survived all of that. Um, they've gained traction because their smaller projects gained um, an influence. And so now there's a desire from the government to hire these practices. And because there is a care, such as the Lu Wen Yu and Wang Shu and the Ju Pei's, and um, it's uh, engaging the local artisans to do the work. Um, it still will be a challenge to think about what happens in the cities where the intensity of construction is very real. Um, and that would be something, you know, that may be a next you know, another kind of dialogue, another, a different kind of chapter than this. This is all about the crafting and keeping the local language, the a resiliency about its culture and keeping the craft intact. You had mentioned um, government wanting to hire some of these practices. That's related to a couple of questions on the chat here from Karen. She's asking, are these approaches finding an audience in public projects as well? And she's also asking what you think of the, of the work by Neri and Ku. Sure. So, um, Mariam, let me see. I almost was going to show their work. Uh, they are another um, emergent and present voice. Uh, so I, I wish I had time. I was going to actually pull up their work and show everyone. So maybe I can add it to the slides later or something so you guys could have it. Um, they, they are also, a, they work on small projects, but they are an emergent voice that is about, um, I wanted to show a Hutong project where they manage in the stitching of the voids in the Hutong, they created uh, livable spaces at a, you know, in a, in a scale of the Hutong, but workable in the city. Um, the other part of the question about, uh, was it about larger projects then? Is that what you're, uh, was that the, um, oh, the private. So the, um, Kil the Imperial Kiln Museum is not a private project. It's actually sponsored by and paid for by the city. So I think it just depends, you know, on the, on the condition or the situation. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just scrolling down here, looking at some of the other questions, Yim. Um, there's a question from uh, Ethan who gave our first talk. Uh, and I think it's a great question because it's related to a lot of what I'm seeing with some of our undergraduate students mm -hmm. at the upper levels in the fourth and fifth year theory courses mm -hmm. um, who are asking very good questions about what's happening in Chinese architecture today and how it is meant to relate or how it's meant to cultivate some kind of connection to um, traditions, Chinese traditions in architecture and history. Um, and so Ethan's asking, is there a larger strategy of a new critical regionalism that's developing, 
given that so many historic builds and areas have been raised, that so much of the new design has been imported. Right, which is, um, which is why I try to avoid um, the work that's been built there, like Stephen Ho. I mean, and nothing, nothing wrong with the international architects that work in China. Uh, I wanted to elevate the work that's done now, currently, like within the five or six years. Uh, even the Dean um, Ma, uh, it's, it's uh, Ma Da, Ma Da, Dean Ma of um, Southern California University. Um, he's actually kept a practice here and also in China. And the idea is that when you talk about the critical regionalism, it's about, actually, it's about understanding what is it about that place and it may be a different way of framing because we're all we're always grappling. What does Frampton mean by a critical regionalism? And we know those seven points to many many of us may seem oh, but it's too wide, and yet it's also specific at the same time because you can apply it to the unique condition, which is why I also equate it to a cultural resiliency, meaning you have to understand the culture of that place to extract what is essential to that place. And I think what China has learned is that it has raised so much. Like I remember um, in Shanghai in 2010, when I took my students there, we actually were there to do the earthquake um, work in Beishuan. So it was in Chengdu. And so we were in the west of China, but we left through Shanghai and went through. Would you want more mac and cheese? Uh, the, we saw the Shanghai Expo and realized that from the air, the whole city uh, was, actually, was raised by then. And so all the hutongs that were there um, are completely gone, and it's a. It could be a city almost anywhere, except the except that the bun is quite unique, right? So, although very colonial, so it's not even you know it's not Chinese, right? It's very colonial from that period. So I think China now has an ability to really think about its own situation. Uh, even ten years ago, ten twelve years ago, because of the booming economy. And the rise in population, there was all this pressure to build, build, build. So it's only now, I think in the past few years, there's been an opportunity to think about, well, what are we really building? And so this critical regionalism is actually quite important. It'd be pretty tough in a city like Shanghai to figure out what is that context. Um, but there is a context there. Um, haven't spent enough time in Shanghai yet to dissect its fabric. It'd be worth a a great studio to do. I think it. I think it's important reading for any architecture student, right? Frampton's critical regionalism, and I think mm -hmm. you just summarized. You just summarized it as a sort of potential strategy really well. I, I think there are problems that have to do with. If this makes sense. The scale of culture. So, can you address a whole country? Can you address a whole region? Can you address a city? Can you address just a city block or a neighborhood? Right. And can you really truly expect to to extract from that some essential cultural principles or mm -hmm. some any essence at all? In fact, I mean, we we know that across even something as small as a as a city or a neighborhood, the cultural context, the conditions, the the shared practices and beliefs of people can be wildly diverse, and so that already begins to muddy the water a little bit for trying to apply a, a strategy like critical regionalism. It's, I think it's a difficult thing, right? It takes a lot right. of tact. Yeah, I definitely agree. Yeah, and, and your point about even within a block, uh, it, it can be the reading, uh, the reading can be very different. But it's actually quite important because we're so busy. I, I, I remember, um, there was a quote that I read while I was putting this together, and it was about slowness. Oh, Zhu Pei talks about slowness. And 
ma ma uh, ma da ma from mada uh, took eight years to build the father's house and the vineyard that's next to it the wine place um, and I think this idea about slowness and thoughtfulness is, is actually quite important, although I know that there's always pressure, well, get this thing built, get this thing done, but it's also to be able to reflect. And it also makes me think of that, um, it was an essay that Billy Singh and Todd Williams wrote about slowness. So I think the equation, the, the equation to that is not being slow, meaning physically slow. It's about being thoughtful about what we build and how do we think about context and regionalism? What, is it, what does it mean? But it still is pervasive. It still is evident and present. There's a question, Yim, uh, on that point. Who are some of the critical regionalists designing in China today? Uh, to, well, uh, these three are for sure. Um, I let me see. So there's uh, I had a I had a list. Um, so you have Ma Yang Song. Let's see. Um, that caught me off guard a little bit because I wanted to add to this, and I realized, oh, you have to sort of stop at a certain point. Well, I mentioned the four, so Ma Yang Song is the fifth. Um, there's definitely more, more than, oh, Yang Ho Chang. I'm sure you guys have seen his work. Uh, he's another person to look at for um, identifying a locale and how do you operate from within that, within a local framework, but also thinking in the context of architecture, what is one, what is one thinking and building at this time as well? I think you've uh, whetted the appetite of a lot of people in the meeting right now. I think everybody wants to get out there and get back to studio and design. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I, I think I think we'll we'll get to that here shortly. Maybe just a couple of final questions, Yim. Oh, okay. There's one question asking whether any of these or whether these rising stars were educated exclusively in China or did many of them get some or part of their education internationally? Uh, right. So that's a good question. Um, Lu Wen Yu uh, did not go abroad to study. She studied, uh, she studied in China. Wang Shu I believe went to U of Penn. Uh, Yu Pei was somewhere on the, oh, Cal Berkeley, of course. I mean, <laughs> I kind of vaguely remember that. So some of the architects were educated abroad, not, but we would actually have to do a survey to figure out because influences come from many, many thoughts of thinking. I, I don't want to evade the question, but I know that um, Li Shanning, who is now the more prominent writer in theory and criticism, uh, went to MIT, you know, and with Michael Hayes, they studied there, right, under the critical, the PhD program. So some, so it's hard to tell, like, how many. I think that would be a good survey to see as we look at their work. Uh, another question here, do you have a course, like a course in our school on ideas of architects from Asia or Africa? We don't seem to have this dialogue in the AAU yet. That'd be a great course, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, sure. That would be a great one. I mean, we, we could certainly put one together. <laughs> Just give us some time. <laughs> Should we write a course? Yep. Yeah, we have some brain power there. Braden's one of them, right? Um, and then David, who uh, presented a couple weeks ago, says, or asks rather, does this dialogic allow or even embrace seemingly unrelated or conflicting ideas or references? Meaning, can the deep local history, the imported pastiche, and the academic rigor coexist 
and inform one another. Right. So when I showed the housing project that had the three deities, um, and they, they, they look more like um, the statues rather than architecture. Uh, I, I don't know if that would be part of included in the pastiche, but there was an image earlier that just had um, the rooftops that were, let me see if I could find it. The, yeah, like, you know, like these rooftops that has nothing to do with why they're shaped like that, except that they're trying to copy some image of old architecture. Um, I think that that definitely can be a dialogue or even like the image on the right side, which just has to do with um, colonial buildings that then had layers of other roofs added, you know, on top of them, right? Um, but then when they're juxtaposed with this dialogue, that would offer a kind of critique about why is it that way? How did it become that way? And why, why, would, why are we critiquing the condition that we see or the condition that we approach? Um, so I would agree that there, there can be a really good discussion that would inform what that architecture can be. And sure, architecture, academic rigor, Yes, that can definitely happen as a juxtaposition of what one sees um, as, a as contrasted to what one can um, bring about in a, design, in a design project. I think it's an interesting question because as we imagine many different sorts of uh, cultural productions or references being made across the whole city, or across the whole region of a city, you can you can imagine diverse motifs appearing, and you know where is the line drawn from a healthy diversity of some of those uh, motifs in a critical regionalist view, and yeah. ones that are flat out paradoxical and self contradictory, that you know ones that don't work. Is that something that only people like us that have architectural taste see and notice, or is that something the public notices as well? I think that's it's a lot to think about there. Yeah, I I remember um, for the Kiln Museum, when you have to walk through those arches, I remember reading that uh, what Jupe wanted was the experience that's familiar, which is the, the, the brickwork and the kiln, the quality of that. Uh, and yet there's a newness that one discovers from what's been created. So I think that's that juxtaposition, right? There's a familiar and yet there's the encounter of something that's completely unexpected. Um, so I think that the work has great potential if we keep that, you know, sort of as a, as a kind of navigating way of thinking. That's a good way to put it, I think, the, the, uh, the friction of the familiar and the unfamiliar rubbing against each other in one's experience. Um, how about mm. one last question, Yim? Excuse me? How about one last question? Uh, the one that Mark, uh, cheap labor seems to influence, the high level of cheap labor seems to influence the design, right? Right. I'm curious how the relationship to more refined craftsmanship is in the country and does this at all impact building costs? Uh, so what I, so some of the work that you saw today, um, because it were by the local craftspeople and not caught up um, in what Lamar was asking earlier, like there's a whole other systematized, you know, method that that is also being used. So I'm, I don't want to discount that as well, right? In fact, that's almost more prevalent in the cities and, and the new construction. So what I understood from Jupe's museum is that because it was locally done, um, I mean, they won't tell you the cost, uh, but from reading the things, I had my father-in-law translate it in Chinese, from Chinese to me, um, 
that it was the local crafts and local labor that made that museum possible, even though it was a public project. I mean, it was a government project, but it was still possible. So I think that the building costs, if we want this kind of crafts, I can imagine that in a situation like a city, it, it may be quite dear. I don't know, I, I'd have to find a specific condition to validate that. I have to admit that I biased the presentation to the local crafts people <laughs> and architects who want, to, who want good craft. <laughs> it's another possible site of conflict, isn't it? Uh, local craft, handicraft versus the growing emphasis and prevalence of, um, um, you know, robotic practices, machine produced practices. Right. Yeah. Printing and so on. Yeah. Wow. I think there's a lot to work with here. Yeah. I mean, we could continue, I think, for hours. Well, I thank everyone for keeping this interest um, in your foreground. I think that it's the craft that really is driving a lot of this work and the thoughtfulness about location and the idea of culture and what does culture really mean? I mean, that's, a, that's not an easy question to answer in design either because what we are doing as architects is we're actually making culture at the same time. That's how I see it. Yeah. What a great way to end. What a great way to end your talk and, and our series of talks. Architecture is making culture. Yep. Um, thank you so much yeah, for this presentation. Thank you for the time and thank you for showing us all this. It's been pretty stimulating. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Yeah, thank you too. Do Thank well in studio. I'm expecting right. guys. All right. See you. <laughs> yep. Thank you everyone for joining students and faculty. Uh, we, we hope to, to have more of these faculty talks upcoming. We'll make you aware of that as they are scheduled. But until then, let's have a strong and enjoyable and successful final third, I guess, of our spring semester, right? Yes. Thanks again, Jim. Thank Thanks you. Everybody. Thank you, everyone. Be safe. All yep. right. Yep. Bye. Yep. Bye.